Good evening. Tonight, we examine the links, seen and unseen, between twins. Chang and Eng were the original Siamese twins. They were born in 1811, and although they were never actually separated, they led active lives. They married two American sisters and ran two family homes, spending a few days in each. One had ten children, the other twelve. Chang took to drink, and Eng had to share the hangovers. They were joined together by a fibrous band at the chest. Nowadays, they could easily have been separated. But is there another link between identical twins? A telepathic link that can never be broken. Welcome to Twinsburg 1995. <laughs> Happy Twins Day. Once a year, over 4,000 sets of twins descend on the town of Twinsburg, Ohio. It's the Twins Day Festival, and they all arrive two by two. Our husbands do know us apart. <laughs> they do. They do. Like we're not going to we're going to disappoint the public, but they do know us apart. I'm a little more outgoing than Bob. See, I'm more quiet. I'll dress up more than him and things like that. We were born on April Fool's Day. <laughs> you know, the womb room. Me first, no me, and the last one out is the route Meg. And we just switch on our dates and they never know it. Oh, yeah. we, and we switched in classes. We did all those tricks that twinsies do. To the observer, identical twins hold a particular fascination. The exact physical likeness. The same hobbies. The same tastes. In fact, there's one restaurant owned by twins that will only employ twins as waiters. But they have to work, work at the, the same, same time. time and the same shift. They have to work but together. But they'll screw up and blame it on the or other one. Or they'll switch their name they'll tag. Their name they tags. wear name tags. I'm Juanita, Juanita I'm not Shanita. Shanita. I'm Charlie, Charlie not Darlene. So and our great. motto in the restaurant is you, you can, can only make a first impression once, we make it twice. <laughs> but do twins share more than just physical characteristics? Some twins believe they have a closeness that even conventional science can't explain. We call it twinship, or twin, twin insight. insight. We've experienced it several times. We've been tested to have a high degree of ESP among each one of us. One of the most outstanding one that we had was when I was in a car accident. And I was able to direct help to her without knowing where she was, because I was visualizing it in my mind as it was happening. There will be times that I'll answer the telephone and say, Jeff, what do you want? And I'm not sure it's him, but I can tell by the ring or something that it's Jeff. I mean, it's amazing. My first baby, she was down the shore, vacationing. She wasn't due yet. I wasn't due for the baby. She gets up in the morning at 7.30, which she doesn't do on vacation at all. Never. And she I couldn't pain. walk. Couldn't walk. I could not get out of bed. I got out of bed and fell on the floor. Well, I was with my older sister, and she's like, what's with you? And I go, must have been a bad mattress. Now I'm walking like this. We get, now, now we call. I go, something's wrong. So we call her husband, and he goes, Jill had the baby. I'm like, she didn't have the baby, she's not due yet. And he goes, yes, she did. And she never told me this story. She was in, she felt my labor pain. Yeah. Never told me this story. Now, the second time I got pregnant, I said, I'm pregnant. And she looked at me and she goes, said, not, not again. For identical twins, this is the moment of creation. The egg splits and two separate fetuses begin to form. Two individuals, but with identical sets of genes. Science maintains that at the moment of separation, all links with the other half are broken. But does an invisible connection remain? Dr. Susan Blackmore, who has studied twin behavior, remains unconvinced by tales of twin telepathy. If they're identical twins, they are genetically the same. So their brains are much more similar than most people's pairs of people's brains would be. And so they think in similar ways. Then there are all the things where twins are brought up together in their own background. And all these things can lead to what appear like the most extraordinary coincidences, but actually they spring from their lives together. But what if twins had never lived together? What if they were separated at birth? It's from this group that some of the most incredible stories have emerged. On the 19th of August, 1939, a woman gave birth to identical twin boys in Bradford, Ohio. Due to family pressure, she was unable to keep them and she agreed to put them both up for adoption. Four weeks later, Ernest Springer, a maintenance engineer, and his wife, Sarah, adopted one of the boys. 
Two weeks after that, Jess Lewis, a boilerman, and his wife Lucille took the other child away. There was nothing unusual about the adoptions, except for one small coincidence. Both families decided to call their sons James. The twins, it seemed, had been separated for good, identical in every way, but destined to be strangers for the rest of their lives. Over half a century later, James Lewis is now living in Lima, Ohio. He was six before he learned he had a twin brother. It would take over 33 years of searching to track him down. I took the adoption paper to court where the adoption took place, and I told the judge what I wanted to do. And he said, well, I'll see what I can do for you. Jim Lewis's twin brother, Jim Springer, was also living in Ohio when he received a letter from the adoption agency. It gave him quite a shock. For 39 years, he'd believed that his twin had died at birth. Well, I was very surprised and everything. I didn't know what to make of it. I didn't know, you know, whether it was true or it was a hoax or... I always kind of had a feeling that, you know, he wasn't dead, but yet, you know, the, all the proof was said that he was, so... Jim Springer decided to phone Jim Lewis. It was the first time the brothers had spoken. Strange, very strange. We didn't know what to say. It was short, it was short. He uh, introduced himself to me and he told me what he wanted to see me about and everything. But I do remember one thing funny. He asked me what kind of beer I drank. And of course we both like Miller's Light. And pretty soon, uh, I just blurted it out and asked Jim if he was my brother. What did he say? Yes. It seemed a cruel twist of fate, but the twins discovered they'd spent most of their lives living only 40 miles apart. After the initial phone call, they arranged their first meeting. It was February 1979. It was like standing there looking at myself. I felt very close to him from the beginning. He wasn't a stranger. He wasn't a stranger at all from the very very moment I saw him. It wasn't like meeting somebody you know for the first time. Did like I knew him. The story might have ended there. Two brothers, separated at birth, happily reunited in middle age. But as the two men began to discuss their lives apart, an extraordinary series of events were revealed. Good. For nearly 40 years, it seemed, the two men had been living parallel lives. The coincidences began in childhood. At school, for example. I never liked spelling, and I never and I liked math. Math, we, we liked math, we didn't like spelling. Back home, both boys came up with unusual names for their dogs. Toy, T-O-Y. I called it Toy. Now, where, why I ever named it that, I don't know. It's the name I gave the dog. The twins left school, and there were more coincidences they discovered they both enrolled as police officers. Jim worked for Miami County, I think, police department. I worked for Shawnee Township Police Department. Uh, we were both doing the same job at the same time. The two Jims went on to marry and become fathers. Again, their lives seemed to be running in parallel. My first wife was named uh, Linda, and my second wife was named Betty. OK, first one was, was Linda, and then my second wife was Betty. Betty and I have a, a son. We named him, named him James Allen. When I was married to Betty. We had a, our first son was named James Allen. In their spare time, the two men continued to mirror each other's behavior. Both men liked to unwind after work by smoking the same brand of cigarettes and drinking the same make of beer. They both enjoyed woodwork and built basement workshops in their houses. Outside, they had white benches built around the trunk of a tree in their gardens, where Jim Lewis's remains to this day. One of the more astonishing coincidences occurred over holiday plans. There's nothing unusual in going to Florida every year, but Florida has thousands of miles of beaches, and every year, Jim Lewis and Jim Springer would go to exactly the same stretch of beach. Several times I've been to uh, St. Petersburg Beach at a particular spot of about one mile long, and it's got water around it. I got a canal on one side and, and, of course, the golf on the other. It was very amazing that we were never ran across one another because we had vacationed there so, a couple times about the same time. Wives with the same names, same jobs, 
same hobbies, even the same holiday destination. But one of the biggest surprises came after they met. They were invited to the Minnesota Center for Twins Research, where they took a battery of tests. The results were so similar, the researchers made them take the tests again. Some of the tests that Jim Lai took on the multiple choice, they had to do over again because Jim Lai answered almost the same identical questions, the same answer. The lives of the Jim twins seem so incredible because until very late in life, they'd never even met. Were the similarities coincidences or some form of telepathic communication? Their identical genetic makeup would account for some of these similarities, but the names of their wives, sons, and even dogs? Skeptics argue that it's easy to be deceived. We start looking for certain types of coincidence. What you don't do is ask, well, what sort of car have they got? What sort of animals have they got? What sort of music do they like? You don't ask those other questions, which will come not to be coincidences. You just conveniently forget about those. So the process of selection produces an awful lot of amazing looking coincidences that really aren't. The Jim twins admit their lives aren't perfect mirrors. Jim Lewis divorced Betty and is now married to Sandy, while Jim Springer is still married to his Betty. There is a joke about that. My wife's very afraid I'll meet a woman named Sandy one of these days. <laughs> but can the twin story really be put down to a quirk of fate, a series of bizarre coincidences? The chance happenings in the twins' lives seem so unbelievable and so numerous that it's hard not to consider another possibility. But the two men were never completely separated back in 1939 and somehow maintained a telepathic link for the rest of their lives. Researchers have now studied the lives of hundreds of identical twins who were separated at birth, but none of them can match the astonishing series of coincidences shown by the Jim twins. According to a recent survey, nearly half the people in this country believe in ghosts, and one in seven actually claims to have seen one. If you're among that number, then you may not find tonight's eyewitness accounts all that surprising. But reports of independent witnesses all seeing the same ghost over a short period of time are rare. And a further mystery remains. Why was this ghost more upset than the people who spotted her? Flittick Manor has stood in the heart of the Bedfordshire countryside for 300 years. For over half its life, it was the ancestral home of the Brooks family. But at the end of last year, builders moved in to renovate the manor. It's now a hotel. They stumbled upon a secret room in the roof, which had lain undisturbed for decades. We came up to start work on the roof and remove the, start to remove the tiles and then remove the brickwork. We found a small doorway. Then we found the evidence of a frame in the end of the roof, which indicated that sometime there was, a, there was some sort of attic room here. After that, things started to happen at Flittick Manor. Just three days later, the hotel received an odd complaint from a departing guest. As a hotel receptionist, I have had some odd complaints, but I have to say that I've never had a complaint like this before. Everything all right for you, sir? No, not really. Why? What happened? I think I had a visitor during the night. Something or someone. I don't know what happened. I just know I never want to stay in that room again. I'm sorry I had an uncomfortable night. Um, can I get someone to help you with those No, bags? it's all right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. He seemed slightly nervous then. I didn't really know quite what to say and basically didn't really take a lot of notice of it. But from then on, various members of staff began to notice that something had changed at Flittick Manor. Sonia Banks, the hotel manager, was staying on the second floor one night. I had just locked up the hotel and I was retiring to room eight.
Then I heard footsteps walking across the ceiling and a door slammed towards the front of the house where the little room had been discovered. I must say I was a bit taken aback and surprised at this because I was the only person in the hotel that night. Sonia is not the only person to have experienced a presence of some kind. Chef Duncan Poyser also had to sleep at the hotel one night. His bedroom was also on the second floor. I retired to bed at about one o'clock. Just lay on my back, gently drifting. When I tried to turn, I couldn't move the bottoms of my legs. It was as if someone or something was sitting on them, but there was no one there. Tried again a second time. The third time it was as if the weight lifted up. I was a little bit shocked and startled. It was just a really strange uh, experience, really strange feeling. So what could possibly be happening at Flittick Manor? The first paranormal activity came within days of the opening up of the hidden attic room. Had the builders released something, some spirit, which was now returning to its old haunting ground? Come on. One clue may lie with this man. John Lyle is the last direct descendant of the Brooks family to have lived at Flittick. He's now retired to his farm in Wiltshire, but 50 years ago, John spent his childhood at the manor. My mother used to tell us when we were children that when she lay in bed at night, she would hear a ghost knocking on the bedroom door. And there was also quite a few stories in the village about the fact that Frittig Manor was haunted. Those stories have been forgotten in recent times, until the hurried departure of that hotel guest. John Hines will never forget his stay at Flittick Manor. I detected that there was something in the room with me. I got a feeling that uh, there was a presence there. I can't describe it. John Hines had checked into his room at Flittick following a business conference. He went to bed around 1 a.m. Five minutes later, something very heavy landed on the foot of the bed. Fumbled around to try and find the light switch. And there was nothing there, nothing there at all. Oh, this is crazy, John, you know, get back, go back to sleep. I've tried to settle down again. Uh, a few minutes later, there's a shuffling at the bottom of the bed. There was a silhouette of a person actually sitting at the foot of the bed. I froze. I was petrified. Who are you? What do you want? No response from her. She just sat there gazing out towards the window. John spent the rest of the night awake, a grown man too scared to turn the lights off. I consider myself to be a very skeptical person. And I really can't believe that it was a ghost that I saw. But I have no other explanation for it. Is there anything in the history of Flittick Manor which might explain the apparition? Richard Morgan is another descendant of the Brooks family who lived there throughout the 19th century. He has made a detailed study of his family's history. The first of the families to live here, John Thomas Brooks, kept a diary. 
and that describes the life here. It's quite clear that the most important event, as far as uh, the diarist was concerned, was the death of a much-loved only daughter, Mary Ann Brooks, who was only 26. This is the entry for the 20th of September, 1848. I sat by her dying bed, watching her with the most intense earnestness and misery. And at seven o'clock, her breathing having gradually become weaker and weaker, she gently drew her last breath on earth. They were all very shocked when the daughter died. It was clearly a terrible shock to them all. And I think the mother in particular one must pick out as being a, a tragic figure. She outlived her husband by 20 years. She died aged 86 of senile decay. And I think one has to say that she is rather a sad figure. Could this woman's personal tragedy be linked to John Hines' ghostly sighting? or the events which happened the very next night. Hotel receptionist Lydia Dawson had a night she'll never forget. was just beating so fast. Um, and I was just begging that she'd go away. <laughs> My heart was thumping the whole time. It's, I'd just never seen anything like it. I came back into the room, I found that all the lights were on, and I know I hadn't actually put them on myself. I think the reason that I was actually so upset was I sensed that she was crying, so she was upset, which was then causing me to feel upset. And at Flittick Manor, the unexplained happenings continue even today. Whoever she is, she's totally harmless, and we've just got used to having her around. Perhaps, but the staff don't like to stay over anymore. Things have now quietened down at the manor, but it just goes to show you ought to think twice before getting the builders in. I'll be back next week with a special edition of Strange But True. Until then, good night. <laughs>